What's cracking guys? In this video I'll be covering an older paper uh, called Paired Open-Ended Trailblazer or POET for short, uh, endlessly generating increasingly complex and diverse learning environments and their solutions uh, by this group of people that used to work at Uber AI Labs and you may recognize Kenneth Stanley as the current open-endedness AI lead at OpenAI. So the reason I'm covering this paper is because it's super interesting. I, I think it's a very nice model of the evolutionary process itself. And the main differentiation point between Poet and um, many of the like common and mainstream approaches nowadays is that they do keep like the not, not a single environment that's that's kind of crafted and that's very hard, but they instead keep up set of environments and corresponding agents and they keep on mutating the environments they keep on optimizing the agents for their corresponding environments and additionally they have this transferring where they do like a type of a competition where you try to find the best agent for a particular environment and if it outperforms the current niche champion then you replace the niche champion with that better agent and you keep on repeating this process so that's a high level uh, kind of picture now let me show you the, their video and then we'll get back to the paper Okay, now that you have a rough idea of what's going on in the paper, let's dig a bit deeper. Uh, they say here that while the history of machine learning so far largely encompasses a series of problems posed by researchers and algorithms that learn their solutions, an important question is whether the problems themselves can be generated by algorithm at the same time as they are being solved. Such a process would in effect build its own diverse and expanding curricula so diverse and expanding curricula and the solutions to problems at various stages would become uh, stepping stones towards solving even more challenging problems later in the process. So let me contrast this, this description here with what's usually um, uh, done in, for example, reinforcement learning. So usually what you end up with is you, you have a complex environment. Like let me denote that as, a, as this big big square here. It's a complex environment, for example, Dota or, or StarCraft or like Go or Chess or all, or all of those environments we've uh, used to seeing and we know are, are, really ch are very challenging. And what they do is they, they basically um, train a very specialized agent uh, so that's, that's kind of very performant at that particular environment. And so it's a very convergent behavior. So you, you have one agent and you're training it and then you converge to a single set of weights and then you can just deploy the, those, that model in the environment and that's it, the, the process stops. 
So on the other hand, what this open-endedness is all about is instead of having this single environment and a single agent that's adapted to that environment, why not instead keep like a set of, of a collection of various different environments? And let me denote those by different re rectangles here. Like this is one environment and then we have like a second different environment and then we have like a third environment here, et cetera, et cetera. And you keep on optimizing uh, corresponding agents for each of these environments. So as you can see, these are very adapt to these particular environments. Okay, I'm gonna denote them. So yeah, they kind of fit perfectly together. That's 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 kind of a pictorial way to uh, for me to uh, to tell you that this agent is very adapt for this particular environment here. So. Other than having a set of uh, environments and agents, which wouldn't be that uh, interesting in and of itself, what they do is they occasionally mutate these environments. So let me denote that something like this. So this environment is gonna be changed, it's gonna become maybe a bit different, maybe it's gonna have like something like this. And then this environment here may become like a bit different after the mutation. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And now you keep on optimizing the agents for these novel environments. So now you'll end up with an agent that's kind of fits perfectly together into uh, this environment here. And the same goes for all of the other uh, environments here. So you do, do this for all of the pairs of uh, environments and agents. And uh, the final step in there, in, the, in this open-ended process is to uh, every now and then uh, take all of the agents you have. So take all of these agents and basically make them compete on one of the environments. So for example, you take this one and this one and this one, and you see which one of these is the best for, let's say for this particular environment. And if this one, if this like second agent here is better than this one, then you just kinda uh, kill this one and you replace this agent with this one here. And that's the, th those are the high level components that are needed for this open-endedness poet process. Uh, we'll see more details as, as, as I go deeper into the paper, but that's, that's the rough idea. Okay, let's continue. So the results show that POET produces a diverse range of sophisticated behaviors that solve a wide range of environmental challenges, many of which cannot be solved. So that, this is an important point here, as they'll be comparing a POET with these more uh, direct types of solutions. So they, they cannot be solved by direct optimization uh, alone or even through a direct path curriculum building control algorithm. We'll see what that means in a second. Uh, introduced to highlight the critical role of open-endedness in solving ambiguous challenges. So as you probably noticed by the very description of this framework, I did not specify any particular class optimization algorithms that is going to be used uh, to adapt to, to, to adapt the agents for their corresponding environments. What they use in practice here is the evolutionary strategy algorithm. So let me uh, start by explaining uh, what those what that class of algorithm is all about for those of you who are not familiar with evolutionary algorithms. So the idea is actually fairly simple. What you have is the following. So let's imagine we represent our agent as, an, as a simple MLP, uh, so multi-layer perceptual network. So let's imagine we have like some input uh, observation and then we have the agent represented as this MLP with multiple hidden layers and then we have the final linear layer and out comes the output. Like, for example, this is the action space of the agent. And as you can imagine, this contains a bunch of learning weights and we can kind of flatten those out into a vector. And let's denote that vector as, as theta. So this is a vector uh, theta. And this theta is obviously a multi-dimensional vector depending on how many parameters you've got. And we can represent it as a, as a point in space, like as a, as a way of visualizing that, uh, that uh, theta vector, we can represent it as a, as a point in 2D space. So obviously because it's multidimensional, we'd have to do some type of a, a dimensionality reduction method in order to plot it like this, but you, like bear with me, this is, this is the visualizations I'm gonna use. So now what uh, evolutionary algorithms do is in their most common form is you fit a Gaussian um, like on top of this, of this uh, theta vector. So this is, let me just denote it again, this is theta vector. This is where you start from. And then you fit a Gaussian uh, on top of this vector. So basically what it means, you take it as a mean, you take this vector as the mean of the Gaussian and you have some, some, some basically covariance matrix. It's usually just isotropic uh, like a Gaussian. And so what the idea here is, 
is now you're going to sample randomly sample uh, novel agents so according to the Gaussian distribution so because it's Gaussian is more dense here you're gonna have more agents here you'll have some agents here you'll maybe have one agent here and so on and now what you do is you take all of those uh, like novel random agents and you evaluate them at the environment at hand and you get the associated fitness uh, you get the associated score of that agent in this particular environment at hand so let's now imagine that um, for example, this agent here got a score of 150, this one got a score of let's say 60, this one got a score of like 35, uh, this one like 40, or like uh, I don't know, like five or whatnot. And you can imme immediately see that probably this part of environment is for some reason, so the weights that are in this part of the space are, are kind of more valuable for this particular environment. And so you intuitively want to move your vector, your theta vector in this direction. And so, so how you do that practically in, the, in these uh, class of evolutionary algorithms is the following. So you have associated perturbation vector that you used in order to get to this particular agent from this theta, initial set of, uh, set of weights. So, and you, you, you have like corresponding perturbation vector for all of these uh, novel agents here in the environment. And so what you'll do is a simple, uh, in practice you just do a simple weighted average of all of these vectors and you can imagine that after you do that, so after you multiply this vector here with, with 150 and this vector here with 60 and you do the same for these other vectors, uh, you'll end up with a resultant vector that maybe goes, that maybe looks like this maybe you end up going in this direction here. And so you move, and because you have a learning step, you'll, you, you won't move too much, you'll maybe move like here. And so this is your novel theta, so this is theta prime. Okay, again, reiterating what we've done here is we've, we've taken the initial set of weights theta, we've fit a Gaussian on top of, of that uh, theta vector, and what I mean by that is basically you take the theta as the mean of the Gaussian and you somehow pick the covariance, it's usually isotropic Gaussian, then you sample n random points from that Gaussian, and what you do by doing that is you sample n novel agents, and then you evaluate those agents on the environment at hand, you get some associated uh, like scores, and you just create this weighted uh, sum of uh, all of these perturbation vector. And when I, when I say a perturbation vector, uh, what I mean is basically this vector here. Uh, so what it took to get from theta, so from, from, from the original uh, like vector here to get to this novel candidate uh, agent. So that, that's the high level uh, understanding of what's going on. Now let me show you how the formulas look so that you're not confused next time when you see the formula. Um, I think it's always good to have this type of grounding and under, like visual understanding of what's going on or like just the semantics be behind the notation. Okay, let's first start and understand this, this more general formula here uh, where instead of a modeling distribution as a, as a Gaussian, you, ha you, you kind of, you parameterize your distribution using the, the, the weights theta. So those are the, the, the weights you start from. So this vector here and you somehow model that probability distribution. And so the idea is, so this, this tells you the same story I just told you about. So this E theta of I just means how, how well does this theta I agent uh, perform on this particular environment E? So this will be a score like for example, 150 as we saw before. So let me just connect this with the drawing here. So this particular set of weights here, so this novel candidate vector is gonna be theta I and E of theta I, so that the performance of that agent on this particular environment is gonna be 150 as we saw here, okay? So that's how those two connect. Uh, next up, um, let's imagine that under the current probability distribution that's parameterized by theta, uh, this agent theta I has a probability of 0 0.4. And because it has such a high score, like intuitively, we would love to increase this probability the next time we sample from this probability distribution. So optimally, uh, when we do a single step of, of evolutionary strategy, algorithm will boost up this one to maybe 0 0.6. So we'll have more probability put onto, on top of this particular set of weights, which makes intuitively sense. So again, this term here tells you 
what's the what's the fastest way to increase the probability uh, of this particular theta i. So that's what gradient does. It, it, it shows you the direction of the steepest ascent so that you can maximize this this uh, term here. And so it's weighted by the, the score that that particular agent achieves. And then you just do a sum across all of the n samples. So n samples are are those random, the random samples we take uh, given the, 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 the initial set of weights theta here. Okay, that's how those two connect. So that's just a more general notion of, of this whole um, evolutionary strategy setup. Uh, if we assume now that the probability distribution is a Gaussian, this is how this uh, expression uh, like transforms. You can see again we have a sum across n samples. This time we find how performant are these agents. So this here is now going to be theta i. Let me just change the color. So this here is a new set of weights called theta i and we just have to so epsilon subscript i is just a sample from the standard gaussian distribution so this is basically sampling from your gaussian and uh, you then evaluate the that novel model on the on the environment you, you get the score and so as you can see here you just use those as the weights for these resultant vectors so those resultant vectors are are exactly these dotted lines I showed here and so yeah basically this equation uh, is the formulaic way of, of describing how evolutionary search works. Okay hopefully uh, that helped you better understand the evolutionary strategy algorithm. Uh, as a final note this uh, theta plus sigma times epsilon sub i can be denoted as this so it's a it's a Gaussian with mean equal to theta and with uh, covariance matrix equal to sigma uh, identity matrix. So you're basically sampling your agent from this distribution here. You evaluate uh, and find the score on this environment E and then you use that as the weight to multiply these perturbation vectors epsilon sub i's. Okay, enough ramble about evolutionary strategy. Let's continue and explain, uh, understand the POET algorithm itself. Uh, let's see how it proceeds. So you initialize this list uh, of environment agents uh, as, as an empty list. You add the initial environment and you add the initial theta. Uh, so that's just going to be a random vector. And the initial environment is going to be uh, basically this thing here. So they've been using this uh, by uh, by pedal walker environment, uh, except that this one is already fairly complex. Let me show you how the initial one will probably look like. So it will look something like this. It's completely flat. You don't even have the gap here. You, you will have like nothing. You'll just have a flat environment. That's going to be the initial environment of the poet algorithm. Okay, so let's go back here. And then once you add that initial uh, pair of environment, uh, environment agent pair, so then you do uh, basically a capital T number of iterations and in each of those iterations you do the following. So every now and then you are going to uh, mutate your environments and so as you can see here so T is the current uh, iteration and every now and then which is dictated by the end mutate you're going to execute this. So what does it mean to mutate an environment such as the biped bipedal uh, walker environment we saw here and to understand that, let me let me get to this table here. So basically, each environment is encoded as a, as a as a vector, and you can treat that vector as a, like a gene of the environment. And let's understand the format of that of that gene. Uh, so it looks like like something like this. So here is our vector that encodes the environment, and the first two coordinates here are gonna encode the stump the, the stump height. As you can see here, the initial values are going to be like 0 and then 0 0.4. And that's going to determine uh, the stump heights throughout the environment. Uh, so just to clarify what this here means is that your stump height, so let me draw that as, as, as this. So here you have like stump height here. So stump height and you're going to have the stump height be between 0 and 0 0.4 and you're just going to have like a uniform distribution. So that means all of these heights here are going to be of equal probability and throughout the, the as the environment progresses you're going to be sampling from this distribution. Okay. 
Next up, you have gap width. Uh, so the next two coordinates are gonna be gap width, and then the next two are gonna be step width, and then you're gonna have the step numbers and the roughness. Uh, let me just kind of quickly explain the semantics behind these. So gap width is, I guess, fairly um, clear. So that's this thing here. So this is your gap width. This is the stump height. Um, then what else? They have, uh, let me just check. So we have uh, step height and number of steps. So let me let me see what I can find in the environment with steps. Uh, I think there is one here. So you can see here, so this is here, we have like six steps and you can see what this is the step height. So all of these various different parameters that describe the environment are encoded in this in this vector here. Okay, so an important detail here is this mutation step row, which tells you how are, how are you going to, with each iteration, with each mutation step, how are you going to mutate uh, these, these parameters that describe the environment. So for this stump height, you have 0 0.2, which means uh, you're going to, every now and then, uh, with some probability, boost up this 0 to like 0 0.2 and this 0 0.4 to 0 0.6. And now you, you can imagine you now have a much harder environment because all of the stumps are gonna be between uh, like higher on average than, than, than before. And that's how you're progressively and randomly uh, mutating and making environments harder. You can do that for all of the parameters that describe the environment here. So all, across all of these five uh, columns, dimensions. Cool. Now that we understand the environment, let me first, um, before getting back to the uh, algorithm, uh, explain how the actual agent is constructed. Uh, so you can see here how the agent looks like, and you basically have four control signals. You're controlling the hip torque, you're controlling like, so, so here you're controlling the knee torque, you're controlling the other hip torque and the, the other knee torque. Uh, that's the output. So as for the input, I think they mentioned it somewhere here. Let me just, if I can zoom out, uh, they mentioned here. So um, the agent has 10 LiDAR range finders for perceiving obstacles and terrain uh, whose measurements are included in the state space. Another 14 state variables include hull angle, hull angular velocity, horizontal and vertical speeds, positions of joints, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so all in all you have it's modeled the following way. You have 24 dimensional uh, input observation or, or state. Uh, then you have an MLP here, uh, a couple of hidden layers, and you end up with a four dimensional output vector. So this is four, this is 24, this is just an MLP, and that's everything you need to know about the agent. Uh, the final detail that's important is how do you define the fitness? How do you define the score? And here is the formulaic description of, 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 of uh, the reward. Uh, you can see that if the robot falls, uh, then you, like the robot gets minus 100 reward, uh, so negative reward. Uh, you can see here that we are encouraging the robot to move uh, like rightward, so here delta x, because the x-axis basically, as you can assume, goes from left to right, so you wanna move as much as possible, so that's the delta, uh, as much as possible to the right. Um, then it's penalized for the hull angle, whereas the hull angle is this thing, so basically you wanna make sure, let me zoom in a bit more, so you wanna make sure that this particular angle here, so this angle here, let me denote it as maybe alpha, uh, you want to minimize it, and that means you want to have this this hull being as horizontal as possible. Uh, and the final detail they have here is they're also penalizing for the applied torque. Um, so if we were to explain what this means in, in, in human language, it's, it's basically like a, like, a, like a formal description of this informal statement. Please don't fall move uh, to the right as much as possible, try and keep your hull uh, as horizontal as possible and try to minimize the energy consumption while doing all of that. So that would be like an informal description of what this, this, this reward is encoding. Cool. Now that we understand all of that, let's get back to the algorithm, put main loop. So we got to this line six here. We're somehow mutating the environments 
we saw the mechanism roughly. There is a pseudo algorithm in the appendix I'm gonna show you in a minute. But like for now, just imagine you have like a set of uh, vectors which are encoding for particular environments. You can, you can kind of imagine you, you, you mutate those vectors according to the rules we saw, and then you get novel, novel environments. Okay, now that we have that environment, a novel set of mutated environments, we just iterate through those environments and we optimize the agents here. As you can see in this step here, we're going to take the, the environment agent pair. We're gonna do a single evolutionary strategy step. So this, as you remember, produces the resultant vector. So we just add that resultant vector to the uh, theta that was used as the mean of the Gaussian and we get the, the, novel, the novel set of weights for that agent. So that's how the agents are optimized um, here. Obviously, you can see that we have like the learning rate alpha here. We have uh, sigma, the, 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 the standard deviation for the Gaussian at hand, and all of that combined uh, goes into the input of this uh, ES step, and that's how we update the weights, okay? Uh, finally, and I mentioned this, every now and then, we're going to, so every now and then is determined by this N transfer, uh, we're going to evaluate candidates. As you can see here, we take all of the agents except for the theta t plus one m, except for the mth agent, where m is the current agent in this loop here. And we evaluate all of these agents on the mth uh, environment, and we find the best performer uh, for that environment. And if the score that the best performer achieved is better than the, than the current agent, so than the, the niche champion, then you replace, you basically overwrite uh, so basically, bye-bye the old agent, and here comes the new one, which was the best agent, uh, which is the most adapt agent for this environment, even though it came from some different environment. So that's the, this interesting cross-pollination that's going on. Okay, so on a high level, the Poet algorithm is fairly simple. Uh, you keep this collection of environment uh, agent pairs, you keep mutating the environments, you keep optimizing the corresponding agents for those particular environments, and every now and then you do this cross-pollination step where by for each of the environments, you're going to find the best agent overall, which may come from some different environment, and replace the current niche champion with that one if that happens, okay? So that's, that's everything, and now let me just go to appendix and show you the mutation uh, pseudo algorithm in a bit more detail. So here we are, um, let's see how it works. So we have some list already. We iterate through the list of agent environment pairs and we see if they are eligible to reproduce. And what this means is they basically evaluate the agent M on this environment M and they see what the score is. And if the score is like, uh, if it's not in this, in this, in this uh, range, between like, for example, 50 and 200, they discard uh, that agent for that particular environment. I mean, both the agent and the environment. And why is that? Uh, well, because that means that if you're outside of this range, that means that you're either here, which means you achieve super low score, which means that the environment is probably very hard, or it means that you're here, which means it's you, you have a very high score and the environment is uh, very, very easy. And so you want to kind of uh, filter out those either too hard or too uh, simple of environments. After we, we've done that, we have this parent list. So basically all of the eligible uh, environment agent pairs are there. Then we do the environment reproduce. So this step here is gonna do these random mutations. So you're gonna take the vector that describes the environment, you're gonna do the mutations according to certain rules, and you end up with this child list. Then you again uh, just check this minimal condition, i.e. you check whether they are in this range, you discard the ones which are not. After all of that is done, there is this line 13 where there is something interesting going on. So they rank by novelty. And how they define novelty is using L2 uh, metric. Basically, they, they take the encoding vector and they compare it with all of the other environment uh, vectors, as well as some of the older, like they have this archive of, of older environments, and 
the, the, the further away it is from all of the other environments as defined by L2, the more novel it is. So that's how they define the, the concept of novelty. It's, 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 it's very different compared to the previous environments we, we've seen. And they basically sort this list according to, 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 no, according to novelty. And once we've done all of this, they also here, they have this evaluation of candidates. So they find the best agent for that particular uh, environment and they uh, and if this minimal condition is satisfied then they add the environment uh, agent pair uh, to the list so what can potentially happen here again is that some of the other agents is better at the environment at hand at this uh, at this uh, child environment and then you're just gonna overwrite the agent with this better agent here so yeah, there is a, it's, it's kind of intricate, but you, you got the gist of it uh, already before I showed you this, this pseudo algorithm. Okay, let's get back to the main paper and see where we stopped. Okay, let's get to the results. Um, the first comparison they do is they compare POET with the evolutionary strategy from scratch, which means you find some fairly complicated environment as the one you can see here, and you, either train the agent using POET or you directly train evolutionary search. So you start from a random agent and you try by random perturbations to find the agent that performs well for this particular environment. And it turns out that as, as soon as the environment gets uh, like decently complicated, uh, the evolutionary strategy from scratch starts failing. And they mention here some of the failure cases. So they say here in effect to obtain positive scores, these agents learn to move forward, but also to freeze before challenging up obstacles, which help them avoid the penalty of minus 100 for falling down. This behavior is a local optimum. The agents could in principle learn to overcome the obstacles, but instead converge on playing it safe by not moving. It's a very interesting behavior, like a, like a, like a risk aversity, uh, like being manifested here in these simple agents in, in the most simple of environments. And yeah, I guess we see that in the, in the real, happening in the real world as well. Um, so here you can see the results. Uh, you can see that uh, that that the ES kind of gets stuck here and stays in the same place because otherwise it will fall down and and get a minus hundred reward, which is suboptimal. Whereas Poet can actually, uh, yeah, can actually kind of jump across these these gaps and 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 continue on doing its job. Similarly for these other types of environments, you can see here as soon as a big obstacle comes here, the agent gets stuck whereas the poet keeps on going to the right. Same here, it just stops in front of a big obstacle and does not move, and that's the local optimum that they were referring to. Okay, let's continue here. Um, you can see that poet can solve even some of very difficult environments, uh, and that's that's very, very cool results. <clears throat> okay, here is just the uh, quantitative visualization of how like of this huge gap between poet performance and evolutionary search. By the way, I'm, I'm butchering the names here. Like, I'm not sure whether you can use interchangeably strategy, search, and like just evolutionary system, because I think uh, OpenAI had some evolutionary strategy paper. Uh, so it may be, the name may be overloaded, but I explained the semantics be be behind the evolutionary um, search uh, like a couple of minutes ago. So hopefully that won't be confusing. Um, Okay, now we've seen the direct comparison between POET and evolutionary search. Now you can do something a bit more smart, and that's uh, doing a curriculum-based learning, but like not using POET, which is highly open-ended, but doing a more uh, direct path curriculum learning. Let's see what, what that means. So a natural question then is whether the environments created and solved by POET can also be solved by an explicit direct path curriculum building control algorithm. The sequence of environments starts with an environment of only flat ground without any obstacles, which is easy enough for any randomly initialized agent to quickly learn to complete. Then each of the subsequent environments are constructed by slightly modifying the current environment. Okay, let me try and explain what that means and what's the difference in approach. So on one hand, you have POET. So you start with some random environment, you start with the easy environment, and then you randomly start perturbing that environment. So it's environment number one, you do some mutations, you get to environment number two, and then you do some like uh, mutations, you get to three, and then you get to four, and then et cetera, et cetera, and you end up with environment 
uh, after n steps, which is somewhere here. Okay. So now what they propose is let's start from this very same. So, so this is the original um, uh, environment, which is the flat ground, everything is super simple. Uh, let me just duplicate it here for the sake of, of easier visualization. So we have the same environment. So these two here are the same. So that, those are, that's the simplest environment possible. Now, instead of having this highly nonlinear mutation path towards n, why not just go directly towards n? And when I say directly, as you know, the environment is described by a vector and you can literally linearly interpolate between these two vectors and create a set of environments that goes from one to n by following a much more direct path. And they mention, they explain here how exactly they do that. They say more specifically to get a new environment, each obstacle parameter of the current environment has an equal chance of staying the same value or increasing by corresponding mutation step value in table one until that obstacle parameter reaches that of the target environment. So they do introduce a, a slight uh, stochasticity in this process. It's not just a pure uh, linear interpolation, but like it's very close to that. Okay. So this is the approach they take. And let's now see the results they got uh, comparing to this baseline. Okay, um, here are the results. The, these are something called uh, rows plots. And you can see uh, that, so run one is a single run of the POET algorithm. And as POET was, was running, you can imagine that the environments were getting harder and harder. Let me first expra uh, explain to you how you, you can parse this, 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 this diagram. So each of these five axes here correspond to one of the five parameters we saw in the table before. So that means one is, is, is coding for like gap, one is coding for the stump, uh, size, one is uh, coding for the roughness, etc, uh, etc. Et so the hardest environments are the ones which would be touching basically the endpoints here. So th these would be the this would be the hardest environment possible. So this one here, this is the hardest environment. Okay, so looking at these, uh, these plots here, we can see that so we have here three independent runs. Let me first explain what the columns mean and what the, what the rows mean. So we have three independent runs as and the run like the, the environments were getting harder and harder as the as the runs were progressing. And then we can notice that the blue pentagons is the direct path curriculum. And we can see that it's not able to 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 achieve the same to solve the same a complexity level environments as poet given the similar amount of compute. So again, uh, connecting this diagram with the thing I draw here, uh, basically the, the, the poet does not achieve, never gets to end. It maybe gets to like, uh, manages to solve like some of the environments, the, the more, the more these easier environments, but never manages to actually solve these harder environments. That's what we can see visually on this, on these rows plots here. Continuing on, uh, this is just a, another representation of that same fact. And uh, one thing that's worth mentioning about Poet is the following. So uh, while Poet cannot guarantee reaching a particular preconceived target, these results suggest that in some environment spaces, Poet's unique ability to generate multiple different challenges and solve them may actually still provide a more promising path towards solving some preconceived target challenges. So what this sentence here is telling us is the following. So the, the thing with Poet is it can solve arbitrarily complicated environments, but like, it's not like you can specify in, like up in front, like you, you cannot up front specify this particular environment and tell Poet, hey, go and solve this environment, which I deeply care about. No, you can't do that. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what this approach here tried to do. And we show that it failed. So, the whole point is you have to have this open ended process and you have to be collecting milestones and maybe some of the milestones turn out to be very useful for the problem you care about. So Kenneth Stanley, one of the co-authors of this paper, um, built a, like a whole philosophy behind this, 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 this discovery here. He even has a book, Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned, uh, where he is discussing this this tension that be, that, be, uh, that, be, that exists between having clear objectives and where you want to get to versus having this more divergent approach and he's arguing very 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 um, very strongly for this more open-ended approach as opposed to the, these uh, direct optimization methods and we saw uh, like 
and he uses results such as this one to to, to argument why that might be the best uh, thing to do uh, in the long run. And that's something that evolution itself is doing. It's not like evolution is going towards a particular solution. Um, okay. Let me explain you this very, very interesting diagram that, that kind of shows the power of, of the POET algorithm. So here you can see the parent environment and this particular agent at iteration 400 learned to do this type of like it's dragging its leg very close to the ground. So it's a very, you can see it's a very suboptimal behavior. So the agent ended up in some local optimum and it cannot get unstuck. So what POET does is at one point of time, this agent is gonna perform I'll perform some other agent on some other environment. So that's the transfer we, we saw multiple times. And you see that in this environment, there are stumps. And after training on this, so after training this same agent, so the same set of weights on this novel environment, the agent learned how to straighten up the legs. You can see after iteration 1175, the agent is already walking quite like a the legs are straightened out. And then what happens is after you now copy that agent into the old environment, and you keep on iterating, you can see that here in the parent environment, the agent finally learned how to walk straight. So if you did not have this, this, um, this dynamics where the agent was sent to another environment, trained there, and then returned back to this environment, you would never get unstuck from this local optimum we see here. And so that's that's the whole that's a very powerful thing about Poet. Uh, I guess the the main the main uh, con side of Poet is you cannot, as we saw, we cannot uh, directly solve the environments we care about. We kind of have to be collecting milestones and hope for 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 and hope that some of the milestones make sense for what what we care about. Okay, let me wrap up this paper by stating the possible some possible extensions of of, of Poet. Uh, although obviously the paper was published in 2019, so I'm not quite sure whether any of these extensions happened or did not. Uh, okay, so they say the following. An additional constraint that exists in this initial work is that the body of the agent is fixed, ultimately limiting the sort of obstacles it can overcome. For example, how big of a gap it can jump over. Here too, a more powerful and expressive encoding of morphologies, including when I say morphologies, they mean body shapes, uh, including those like CPPNs, that are based on developmental biology could allow us to co-evolve the morphology and the body of the agent along with its brain in addition to the environment it is solving. I mean, this is a very straightforward extension of the, of the research that was presented in this paper. You can imagine that uh, not only can you mutate the environment and um, then adapt the agents to that environment. But you can imagine that you can also have a encoding vector for the morphology of the agent and you could be mutating that, morpho that, that encoding vector. And by doing those mutations, you can maybe end up with an agent that has like longer legs. Uh, or you can also imagine that you could be mutating the actual like brain architecture of the agent. So that means instead of, instead of like having that fixed MLP I described a couple of minutes ago, uh, so something like this, uh, you can be modifying this architecture as well, mutating the architecture. So you're mutating the architecture of the brain, of the body, and you can also imagine you could be mutating the rewards for each of the environments. So not, why, why just keep the, why keep the, the reward constant uh, as we saw there, like with minus 100 penalty for, for falling, et cetera, et cetera. Let me just find, this is a super long paper. So you could be also uh, mutating the reward and all of that additional diversity could, yeah, probably either end up going towards some space that we don't care about or, or it could be very interesting. Although you probably would not want to give the reward too much flexibility. You want to kind of scope it. You, you, you roughly know what you care about and then you form a space. You, you maybe form a probability distribution uh, across rewards so that some rewards are more likely than some other ones. Okay, those were some uh, candies for your thought. Uh, hopefully you liked this this video. Um, hopefully you found this, this idea of poet uh, an open-endedness uh, interesting. And if you did, share the video out, um, consider subscribing, join the Discord community, and until next time, bye-bye.